All right, yeah, I think let's go ahead and get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Henny Adveni. Uh, so Henny is an associate professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University at the Robotics Institute. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree at Wesleyan University in computer science, uh, did her PhD uh, at Yale, working with uh, Brian Casalati uh, on human-robot interaction, and her work uh, nowadays at, at CMU is also kind of uh, broadly in the area of human-robot interaction. Uh, her group develops uh, techniques that allow robots to learn from humans, to collaborate with humans, uh, communicate their intents to humans, and kind of infer uh, humans' uh, intentions as well uh, to enable kind of seamless uh, human-robot interaction. Uh, she's received a number of awards for her work, including the MSF Career Award, uh, the Okawa Research Grant, uh, and just last year she was selected as an early career uh, spotlight uh, talk for uh, the Robotic Science and Systems Conference, which is uh, kind of one of the most uh, prestigious talks and conferences uh, in our field. So, Henny, thanks so much for taking the time to visit us. We're looking forward to that talk. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, you have better knowledge of my awards than I do. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, it's delightful to be here. And thank you all for letting me come and talk to you, even though I come from Yale and this is Princeton, and so we're not supposed to like each other. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, my work on human-robot interaction. And I'm going to talk about just a, a slice of it that has to do with building collaborative robots by using learning bidirectionally. So my uh, slides will progress. Um, my research broadly covers a bunch of areas, hopefully the flickering stops, a bunch of areas in interaction, um, physical collaboration robots that help people do physical tasks, robots that help um, with assistive manipulation, for example, for uh, users who are motor impaired to do activities of daily living. Um, we look also at assistant driver agents that help drivers recognize hazards and drive more safely. So our domains are broad, but the questions that we ask always come back down to how do we get robots that understand and, and collaborate and communicate seamlessly with people? Um, and the challenge of collaborating with people is that uh, even though a robot might know how to do a particular task or might have particular skills, it still has to modify its behavior for the context that it's in. Um, so for example, a robot might know how to retrieve a cup from the cupboard and fill a tea kettle with water to make tea, but it doesn't know the order that the human likes to do those things, or it doesn't know which of those tasks the human would rather do and would rather have the robot do. So there are preferences, beliefs, intentions, knowledge. There's all sorts of things that are um, internal to the human, but that dictate how the robot should actually be assistive. And so to figure out these, uh, the, how the robot can be best assistive and can solve um, humans' needs, the robot needs to be able to respond to these internal states of the human. Um, now, unfortunately, we don't have direct access to these internal states, but what we can do is uh, learn how people like to do tasks and have the robot adapt online to um, human task performance. And so my work uses machine learning to try to do um, learning from people or human in the loop learning, not for skills necessarily, not to learn how to manipulate uh, a tea kettle, but instead at the task level for understanding things like um, decision making around the order of tasks or um, the responsibility of people. So when we think about robot learning, um, you might think about a uh, framework kind of like this. You start with some learning objectives that the robot has. The robot interacts with a human to acquire data. Um, it interprets that data in some way, uh, makes some kind of representation, and then uh, we have learning that happens and we can evaluate the outcomes. And often, when we're doing robot learning, we start with this simulated data, this conception that data is going to be perfect and clean, because we have to start somewhere. Um, and we simulate a bunch of data that is kind of the way humans would act and um, build our uh, learning systems that way. And then eventually we say, OK, now it's time to add humans into the loop. Let's have our learning agent actually interact with people. Um, and there's this conception that the data from the human is going to be similar enough to the data from the simulation, um, and therefore uh, our learning pipeline will work just as well. 
And of course, anybody who's done Sim to Real knows that that's not true, especially not true with humans. We're very bad at modeling humans. Um, they, uh, it's not like you have the rules of physics um, for human mental states. Uh, we still don't have good models of that. And in particular, the reason that this is very hard is because the kind of data that you get from people is dependent on how the people are able to or present that data to the robot. So the quality of the data that is given to the robot to interpret is dependent on the performance of the human who is doing the teaching. Um, and so my talk today is going to go through this pipeline, and we're going to talk about the different ways that people do present data to robots, how those different mechanisms for presenting data affect the quality of the data or what robots can interpret from it, and then how robots can make that process more uh, uh, seamless and better for humans to get better quality data. Um, so we'll start with this step of interactive data acquisition. Um, when, for a long time, learning from people was the same as learning from demonstration. Um, and we uh, did research on how people can show robots how to do things, skills, and then the robots can mimic them. But more recently, this conception has expanded um, because people teach each other through mechanisms that are far more diverse than simply demonstrations. Um, and so in this uh, first part of the work, we um, mathematically formalized these four archetypes of feedback that people use to teach robots. Um, and I'll describe the formalization in a minute, but for it to be meaningful, I want to tell you about the four archetypes first. Um, so these archetypes are showing, characterizing, sorting, and evaluating. Um, these aren't necessarily a comprehensive set of all ways that people teach, but they are the archetypes we kept seeing again and again in the literature, um, and uh, also in uh, the sort of cognitive science side. So showing, uh, the showing archetype is demonstrations. So the human shows the robot what they want done. The characterizing archetype is about um, humans characterizing to the robot what, uh, what they think about its, uh, about its performance. For example, saying that was good or that was bad. Sorting is about preference, preferences or rankings among relative options. And evaluating is about providing corrections to the robot's actions or um, critiques about what part of the robot's performance needed to change. So to put this in a context that might be a little bit easier to understand, let's think about teaching somebody to swing at a baseball. Um, if you were teaching somebody to swing at a baseball, you might first show them how you hold a bat and how to swing, but that would not be the only thing that you do. And you certainly wouldn't show them negative examples of how not to swing. Um, instead, you might then ask them to show you a swing, and you might tell them that was good. Right, you're characterizing the swing. Uh, you, or that was an 8 out of 10. Um, you might say, that swing was better than the last one. So now you're presenting a preference over multiple options that they've shown you. Or you might say, try swinging earlier, or try holding your elbow lower. And now you're, you're evaluating a particular component of the performance to improve. Um, so we want to formalize all of these uh, different learning archetypes so that a single learning system can accept data in any format and uh, learn in a unified way. And so to do that very briefly, um, I'll present the idea of interactive learning as a Markov decision process where we have two agents, the user or the human you, and the learner, which is the robot agent L. Um, there's a query uh, that uh, is provided by the learner that you responds to. And the interaction is defined by the states that you uh, has uh, of the learner, so the, what, the, what the user thinks of the learner, the set of actions that you has access to uh, for providing feedback, um, a transition function, which is how the learner learns, so that's a property of the learner, and then a reward function that uh, aims to minimize the difference between what the um, learner thinks is true and what the, uh, the actual truth is. Um, and we use these, this formalism, we use this MDP mechanism to describe a few features of feedback. Um, and this is how we sort of classify different types of feedback. So the first feature is query size. So we have that query queue, um, and uh, learner L gives query queue to the user. Um, 
the query size is the, the number of possible actions, the action space of the query. So what can the learner provide? Here, for example, uh, we have a very common uh, robotics learning domain, Lunar Lander, where the goal is to take a rocket and land it between two flags upright. Um, and uh, in this case, the number of actions available is the length of the trajectory, t, or the time uh, taken. In a preference, on the other hand, so this is a, uh, for example, uh, a demonstration the agent might give to get a rating, whereas if the agent gives uh, two examples uh, to get a preference, now the action space is doubled. Um, in addition to what the learner can ask, we also have what the user can respond with. So what are the actions that are available to the user to reply? For example, um, in a rating case, the user has one action available. Um, they can give one piece of information, essentially. Um, what is the uh, response choice space? So that uh, teacher's response is drawn from the, the response choice space, uh, which is all of the actions available. In this case, in this binary feedback case, the human teacher can only give two, uh, one of two actions, good or bad. And then finally, um, we define the uh, granularity of feedback. Um, so how much of Q is, um, is being critiqued or is being given feedback based on user response? So uh, with all of these different features, we can lay out our different interaction archetypes and see that there are meaningful differences between them. So for example, um, in the showing archetype, we, uh, we have demonstrations. Demonstrations have a zero query size because the learner is not querying the user. The user is the one providing the demonstration. And so the user's um, response size is t, the, the length of the trajectory or the length of the demonstration. On the other hand, um, if the learner is asking for labels or binary critique, like I said, then it, the response, the query size is t, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm not going to spend too long on this. If you want to read more about this particular table, you can read the paper. What's important to get from this is that we have these different methods of feedback that are categorically different in their underlying structure. They give different amounts of information from different sets of possible information actions to the robot. And using these four archetypes, we're then able to interpret that data um, and make sense of it. Let me ask about the, the critique. Yeah. Uh, so critique is some Boolean at every time step, or could it be like natural language uh, as well? Yeah, it could. Uh, it could be natural language. You're saying it's Boolean because of the... Just the base, two to the T. The two to the T. Yeah. So I think in this formulation it is, but it, the space could be much bigger, okay. as you say. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, in our formulation for the lunar lander, for the, the kinds of domains we were thinking about, there were not that many. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the choice space wasn't that big. So we use this data and interpret it. But like I said, the, the quality of the data itself. So we, I, I've told you that there are many types of data, but the quality of data also depends on how well people are able to express it. So of these four feedback types, um, we see that they're not equivalent in the information that's provided. But are they equivalent in the effort required from the human? So they're not equivalent on the computational side. Are they equivalent on the human side? Is it as easy for a human to provide a demonstration as it is to provide feedback uh, in terms of preferences? Um, and prior work has said, no, these are different, um, but has sort of relied on more intuitive notions that you know, giving uh, a choice between two options is easier than giving a demonstration, uh, but we wanted to test this actually um, empirically. So we ran a study looking at uh, these four interaction types across two different domains. In this sequential decision-making domain, we use Lunar Lander, so showing what involved a user um, using their arrow keys to drive the little rocket to show a demonstration, categorizing 
um, had the user either give a thumbs up or thumbs down to, some, to a demonstration from the agent. Sorting um, had the user give one of two, like rank two options, tell us which one is better. And evaluating had the user identifying um, the part, the time segment of the demonstration that most affected the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So categorizing uh, is about giving a single piece of information, um, and sorting is about uh, can be more than two pieces of information. It's about um, relative differences. So it's actually a little bit clearer in the classification case. Um, we had a classification task for this reason um, because different domains have different um, implementations of these different feedback types. Um, in this case, the uh, categorizing, basically uh, the, the agent gave a proposed label for a picture and the user again said good or bad, but the um, sorting option gave feedback about two proposed labels, two different labels. Showing was about, showing was the, the human gave a label for the image and um, evaluating the human had to select the squares of the image that most um, drove their label or like had a biggest effect on the label that was proposed. So we have these two study domains. We had people um, perform these kind of teaching tasks in these two domains. But what we were really interested in is not how well people can teach the learning agent. What we cared about is how effortful it was for people to do that task. And so we wanted to measure cognitive load as people were giving these different kinds of feedback. So people, uh, this is an online study. People uh, had a browser open. They would watch uh, either a video or engage in the interactive demonstration uh, as their primary task. So here is an example of what it looked like in the uh, rating task. So people would be given a video. They would play it. They would have to rate the trajectory, thumbs up or thumbs down. That was the primary task. But then we used a secondary task um, to try to get at the cognitive load that was happening. So this is actually a really common method in psychology, the secondary task protocol. You have a primary task that people are doing that is engaging some amount of attention. And then you add a secondary task to that. And you measure their performance on the secondary task with the idea that as the primary task takes up more of their attention, requires more cognitive effort, their performance on the secondary task goes down because they have less cognitive effort to expend on accomplishing that secondary task. So in this case, the primary task was teaching the robot, and the secondary task was monitoring this colored dot at the top of the screen and pressing a button when the dot turned pink. So they could do this kind of on the side, um, and they were told that their primary task was teaching the robot. But we looked at the, um, at the response time to the color switches on the secondary task to get a sense of how much attention they had to give. This doesn't give you an absolute sense of cognitive load, but it does allow you to compare different um, modalities of teaching in terms of cognitive load. So when we looked at um, the response time, what we found is that we did actually have differences in how much cognitive load was being expended for different feedback types. And in particular, in the Lunar Lander case, showing, um, so giving a demonstration, yielded a much higher cognitive load for people than categorizing. And this was a statistically significant difference. Now, this is sort of intuitive. You can imagine that if you are engaged in presenting a trajectory, you are expending more of your attention than if you are simply giving a yes, no, good, bad kind of answer. We also wanted to understand, though, if people felt like these things were harder. So did the subjective perception of effort match the, uh, the actual effort? Um, and so we asked people to rate how much mental effort the task took in different interaction types. And what we found in this case is that evaluating was by far the worst. Everybody hated evaluating. Um, so this required the most mental effort. And then, so evaluating was harder than everything. And then sorting uh, was also rated as harder than uh, categorizing. In other words, giving a preference between two options was harder than just giving a yes, no for one option that was presented. 
So in both objective and subjective measures, we found that there are differences in the different feedback types in terms of cognitive load. We also compared a couple of other um, uh, metrics here. We looked at how long it took for people to complete the demonstration task or the, um, the feedback task. Um, and we found that in sequential decision making, um, the response times for sorting, so response times for evaluating were the highest. Again, nobody likes evaluating. So it took people the longest to give that kind of feedback. And also um, sorting was uh, statistically higher than showing and characterizing. So again, preferences were taking people longer to give than saying good, bad, but also even than giving demonstrations, which is a surprising finding. When we asked people um, to assess their confidence, so uh, at the, uh, after giving the feedback, we asked people to rate how confident they were in their answer. Um, what we found here is that people um, were significantly more confident in showing and characterizing. So showing and characterizing the demonstration and the good, bad lived on one side, and the um, evaluating and sorting, so preferences and critiques, um, were significantly um, harder. People were less confident in their responses, given those. So again, we're seeing demonstrating and characterizing kind of land on the sort of easy side. Evaluating is always hard, and sometimes also um, class uh, preferences. So uh, comparison, sorting is hard. Um, and similarly, when we ask people about their subjective usability of the feedback type, uh, evaluating was found to be the hardest. So you can see that by the, the distribution of the different colors where lower is harder and higher is easier. Um, so generally, people just really hated giving critiques. Um, people found giving uh, categorizations very easy. And then the uh, demonstrations and uh, preferences kind of lived in between. So all of that data tells us that there are differences in how uh, people are able to give information under these different feedback types. Now, the, the results were different for the sequential decision-making task than for the uh, classification task. So you can go to the paper to find those. But we also found that the domain has an impact. So in some domains, it's easier to give a demonstration than in other domains. So this is not a universal finding for all kinds of teaching. But it is uh, evidence that when, we are give, when we're asking people to give feedback to the learner, um, we should also be considering how difficult it is, because not, not all types of feedback are equal. OK, so we talked about the different feedback types and how they are not equal, both in terms of the data that they give us, uh, the learner, us the learner, and the difficulty it is for the human to provide. But how do we know what kind of feedback type needs to be given at any particular time. The one thing we could do is leave it up to the human. Um, but we were interested in identifying whether we could use active learning to select a particular feedback type that would most improve the robot's current understanding while minimizing the cognitive effort required to give that information from a person. Um, and so we uh, built a system called Inquire that uses active learning. And we showed that with Inquire, um, people were able to teach the robot more quickly um, and in more robust ways. So for Inquire, um, this was again, uh, we tested it in a variety of domains, including Lunar Lander and some other domains. Um, demonstrations, I'm just going to go over the four feedback types in this context, because like I said, feedback types depend on context. Demonstrations, um, the robot would ask the person for a demonstration, what should I do? And the person gave them the demonstration. In uh, preferences, the um, robot would present two options, and the uh, teacher would choose one. In corrections, the robot would present one option, and the teacher would modify it. And in um, the uh, binary reward, in evaluating the person would give, uh, or sorry, the learner would give an option, and the person would say good or bad. Now, to choose from among these different queries, the system was trying to um, maximize the potential information gain, the expected information gain, of uh, the particular weight. Yeah? Um, in the demonstration um, examples, is there ever a point where you demonstrate how to not do something, and then the robot's like, 
There is not. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this is something that's different about human in the loop machine learning from traditional machine learning is that people very rarely give negative examples. Um, so no, the, the system was not getting negative examples, except in the sense that um, preferences would say one example is better, so they're slightly negative here. Corrections would, would say you know, that example was, you know, needs to be downweighted and so on. So you would get some, some notion of negative examples, but the system was always presenting its best guess, what, what it thought was correct. Great question. Um, and so now our goal is given a uh, particular state, the, um, the problem is represented as a reward function with a linear reward function with weights. And the goal is to maximize the difference in the weights of uh, before and after learning. And so we calculate out um, the KL divergence of the weights before and after receiving a particular feedback, piece of feedback. So um, the probability of a weight given a particular kind of uh, feedback from a person is uh, compared to the probability of the weight before receiving that feedback. Um, so we're trying to maximize, or uh, we're evaluating the KL divergence. Um, and over all the uh, potential feedback options, we're picking the one that has the highest expected difference. Um, and then we're doing that over all of the interaction types. So we're looking at, given all the options, given all the feedback that I could get within this interaction type, um, what is the, um, what's the expected improvement in my understanding, expected change in my understanding, and then which interaction type gives me the overall highest expected change. Um, and what we found, uh, this is just for the lunar lander example, but um, these, exam these results were fairly consistent. What we found is that using inquire, this uh, information gain method for active learning, um, our learner outperformed um, situations where the learner only used a single type of query. So we compared inquire to situations where the, the learner only used demonstrations, only used um, preferences, um, used a combination of demonstrations and preferences called DEMPREF from prior work, um, only used corrections and so on. And you can see that the, um, the difference from the true weight was uh, lowest for inquire and also the performance on the task was highest for inquire. Now, um, like I said before, the uh, cost of giving different types of feedback is not the same for, uh, for different types of feedback. So people, some are more effortful than others. And so we investigated the diversity of uh, the feedback that the agent would request with and without waiting for costs, the cost on the human. So if we ignored the fact that different types of feedback required different amounts of effort from people, um, our systems generally chose preferences. So the colored bar indicates which uh, feedback type was requested at which interaction interval for the four different types of um, feedback. And you can see that uh, we have the, um, the different domains, linear dynamical system, lunar lander, and pizza arrangement, um, all basically prioritized or were biased towards demonstrations. But when we added the fact that demonstrations could be more costly to give than uh, other kinds of feedback, we started to see increasing variability in what the agent was asking for. Um, and so it was able to learn um, from these other, from these different interaction types while also attempting to minimize the uh, cognitive effort for people. So we are uh, continuing to explore inquire in this kind of multi-feedback based learning. One more thing though. So until now, we have this sort of open loop learning task, right? So we have um, data acquisition from a human, which we have established depends on people's ability to give that information um, and different types of data that the robot might get. But the information is going from the human to the robot one way. And that's not really how learning works in the real world. In fact, we can take advantage of the fact that people are pretty good teachers. And 
they're good teachers when they understand what their student needs to know. This is why attending class in person is really important, guys. <laughs> because we can tune what we teach to what, um, to what our learners need. So if the human has a better model of its learner, then they're going to be able to uh, give better information. And that sort of leads us to the conclusion that our agent, our learning agent, needs to do things that will allow the human to have a better model of its learning agent. So now we're in theory of mind land, right, where our robot is thinking about what the human thinks about the robot. Um, and this could go infinitely, but we're going to stop at that level. But we were interested in whether we can um, model what the human thinks of the robot and then have the robot take actions that show the human what the robot actually knows to bring those two, those two things closer together. Um, and so uh, in a slightly different domain, this is a method for having the robots generate their own demonstrations to communicate their knowledge to the teacher. So until now, we've been talking about humans teaching robots. Now we're flipping the script. And we're talking about robots teaching humans, essentially. Um, these are two sides of the same coin. In this case, we're only going to use demonstrations. Um, so uh, once again, suppose that we're trying to teach um, the robot has some sort of uh, reward function that's driving its policy. Um, and that reward function is a linearly weighted sum of features. How does the robot then illustrate this reward function to people? Like we could tell them the weight on this feature is blah. Um, or we can demonstrate to them how that feature works. And when the feature, we have a hypothesis, we're actually testing this right now, that when the um, feature is, uh, vector, the reward, the reward function is sufficiently complicated, it's much better to give demonstrations than it is to just tell people outright what the weights are. So the goal here was to get the agent to generate a sequence of demonstrations that would be most informative and understandable to people. Um, and so we did this in a very simple domain to start. Um, this is our grid world domain. Uh, we have an agent, the blue triangle, that navigates around this grid world. The goal is to deliver a package represented by a purple hexagon um, to the destination, which is represented by the purple square. Uh, there are tolls, so the yellow boxes are tolls. They have cost. And then there's batteries, the um, green hexagon that gives uh, uh, positive rewards. So the tolls are negative reward, batteries are positive reward. Um, but we didn't tell people any of this. <laughs> what we told them is that the robot was trying to get the passenger to the destination. And it would show you the best ways to do that. But we didn't tell them what the yellow square was or what the green shape meant. We did tell them what the features were. So we have this reward function that's defined by these three features, the number of tolls entered, the, the, uh, whether the battery was obtained, um, and the total number of steps required. And the robot, or the agent in this case, would give people a demonstration that looked like this. So it would walk through the grid, and it would execute the trajectory that was optimal, given its particular reward function. But it wouldn't say why. And the goal here is, given a sequence of these kinds of trajectory demonstrations for the human learner to be able to intuitively understand the weights on the system and be able to play back or tell, tell the agent what it should do in a new scenario. Right? So we're testing the human's understanding of the robot's policy. So I'll go back. <laughs> um, before we have any, uh, any information here, the, uh, the human's hypothesis over the weights um, is uniform. Right? And, and in fact, it doesn't actually matter what the weight values actually are. What matters is the relative difference between the weights. And so we can model the human's understanding of the weights as this unit sphere. And their, their hypothesis is going to lay somewhere on this unit sphere. So before seeing any examples, the hypothesis um, is uniform. And then every demonstration that the uh, robot gives to the human is going to cut down this hypothesis space. It's going to make some of this region um, inaccessible because the demonstration will show that that is incorrect and some of the region will remain. 
So for example, for this particular demonstration in this environment, we see the agent starts um, in one square, goes around a yellow square, um, and reaches the destination. So we have uh, two constraints that are added to our hypothesis space. The first constraint represents the fact that the agent detoured around this toll. It took two extra steps in order to not go through the yellow square. And so now we know that the yellow square um, is at least two times as costly as a step. And so we can cut out half of our hypothesis space where that's not true. Um, similarly, we uh, see that the agent went to the destination with the fewest number of actions, didn't kind of meander around, it didn't go, um, it's more relevant when there's a battery, but fewest number of actions, which means that we can see that step cost is being minimized. And so any hypothesis where step cost is positive can go away. And the region of space left in this hypothesis space is called a behavioral equivalence class, where any behavior that's executed with um, a policy with those rewards is going to be equivalent. Now, prior work um, has tried to um, develop methods for communicating this behavioral equivalence class as efficiently as possible to inverse reinforcement learners. Um, so, uh, for example, in this case, this is an actual example of uh, two demonstrations that are required to fully understand all of the reward weights in this domain. Um, and when we looked at this, we said, wow, that's really hard. Because the reality is that people are not perfect inverse reinforcement learners. So people can learn from example, but there are also cognitive biases that we bring to our learning process and that we have to take into account when we're teaching. So we looked to education literature and cognitive science to understand what good teachers do when they are teaching new topics to students. And we tried to make these demonstrations more meaningful to people. We uh, tried to optimize visual simplicity, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, the visual similarity between subsequent demonstrations. And we used a concept called scaffolding that you might be familiar with to present easy examples before more difficult examples. So in visual simplicity, um, the idea is to make each demonstration as, as uncluttered as possible so that only the relevant elements of that, um, that are necessary for that demonstration are present. So for example, um, the demo one is better than demo, uh, demo option A is better than demo option B, even though these two um, trajectories show exactly the same reward function, or like the optimal for exactly the same reward function. And then for visual similarity, we tried to make subsequent demonstrations as similar to each other as possible by moving around as few features as possible. Um, so option A is a better uh, preceder for, op for op uh, demo two than option B is because it has fewer movement of different features. It's different, it's more visually similar. So when we were selecting demonstrations, first we were trying to um, affect the BEC area. We were trying to give, communicate the most information, but then among the options, we would optimize for similarity and simplicity. Um, and scaffolding, we did based on the BEC area. The idea that um, if you give a demonstration that leaves a pretty big hypothesis space, that's an easier demonstration to parse than a demonstration that's conveying a lot of information uh, about a very specific hypothesis space. So here are three demonstrations. This one leaves a big BEC area remaining, uh, medium-sized BEC area, and a very small BEC area. Because this contains the most information about the weights, um, but can be the hardest. We hypothesized it would be the hardest to parse. And so we ran a study to test this empirically. Um, we, this was, again, an online study. We had 162 participants. They watched an agent um, provide them a sequence of demonstrations in this environment. And then we tested them by giving them a new environment and asking them to find the optimal path, to show us the optimal path. And this is a proxy for how well people can understand a robot's behavior or how well people can predict what a robot will do in a certain situation. So if I'm capable of predicting what my robot will do, um, then I am also capable of teaching it how, what, I needed, what I needed to know. 
So the first thing we found is that, in fact, um, BEC area is a good descriptor of the difficulty of a demonstration. So when we ask people to give us optimal demonstrations in um, different environments, the ones that required uh, the highest uh, knowledge or had the smallest BEC area, people performed less well at. They were less capable of showing us the optimal demonstration than in environments where the BEC area would be quite big. The second thing we found is that visual simplicity and similarity were helpful. So when we were optimizing for visually simple and similar demonstrations, per people's performance on those high difficulty tests, the ones with the smallest BEC area, um, was significantly improved. But what we found, surprisingly, is that scaffolding did not work. Um, we thought it pretty straightforward. You start with the easy examples, you move to the hard examples. Um, and we tested people who saw forward scaffolding, easy to hard, against people who saw backward scaffolding, so the hardest examples first to easy, um, against people who saw no scaffolding, so the demonstrations were in a random order. And confusingly, we actually found that if you look at um, the uh, people's performance on the test, so what percentage of people gave the optimal test response, on low and medium difficulty tests, there was no real difference statistically between these. But on the high difficulty tests, people who didn't get any kind of scaffolding outperformed people who got forward scaffolding, which was our method. <laughs> Not what you want to see, but this is why you know doing these things empirically is important. Um, and so. This led to a question, right? We did a little soul searching and we said, why exactly did uh, this scaffolding not work? What was it? And we dug deeper into the kinds of scaffolding demonstrations that we were showing. And what we saw is that when the agent was coming up with demonstrations, it was coming up with some that were not very intuitive, that were probably not uh, ones that the human had in mind when they were looking at the task. So for example, um, let's say that the correct demonstration would be, would in this environment, the correct demonstration would be for the robot to go through the mud to get the package and then straight back to the goal. But the human might think the mud is quite costly, and so their hypothesis might be that the robot would need to go around the mud to get to the goal. Right? So we have the true um, uh, demonstration and a counterfactual. Uh, but in this environment, the counterfactual ro that the robot might um, come up with would be something like this, because of the way that we were generating counterfactuals. It's not a very realistic rendering of what people would be confused about. And so instead of um, having our system generate these sort of uh, nonsensical alternative hypotheses for people, we decided instead that while we were um, selecting which kinds of demonstrations to, pro to provide. We wanted to also provide demonstrations that maximized the likely human understanding. So we had to model what the people were believing about the robot's demonstrations. Um, and so we modeled not just the entire space of possible hypotheses, but also the weight of different possible hypotheses as a belief space. And so now people have beliefs over the robot's potential rewards. And uh, every counterfactual, that, every demonstration that we're thinking of presenting, um, we calculate how that demonstration would change the, uh, the, the entire belief space, the weights over the beliefs. And we picked a demonstration that would maximize the difference between the uh, beliefs before and after the demonstration. So we are reasoning about not just what demonstration would be most effective, but what demonstration would be most effective given what people are likely to already think. Yeah? Is the possibility assuming a much of a rational update even if the belief is Excellent question. So we started. Um, the question is, did we update assuming a rational agent that like, learns perfectly from the demonstrations? We started that way. We very quickly found that people do not perform that way. Um, and we were having issues because people would see a demonstration that, um, that provided a constraint, and then they would answer the test 
with their answer on the other side of the constraint. And so we added some noise to the distribution here. We're representing this as a particle filter. And we, um, we add some particles that are on the incorrect side of the constraint um, to capture that. And then if we get, um, right now I'm only talking about open loop teaching, but we're working on closed loop teaching where um, if people show us that they do have a belief in that space, we then reweight all the particles and start again. So we have a mechanism for dealing with the fact that yes, people are not perfect learners. Um, and you got to that much faster than we did, <laughs> so good job. Um, we ran a very similar study uh, using this new method of counterfactual scaffolding and compared it to our previous baseline scaffolding that did not try to model what people know. Um, and what we found is that Again, we're looking at performance on uh, the final test as a function of the difficulty of the test, where green is our method, higher is better. And we found that for the highest difficulty tests, people did perform better when they received scaffolding using our new counterfactual method, when we pay attention to what they know, than uh, when they received scaffolding without. However, um, and this is always true of HRI, uh, we also found that that led to more mental effort. So when we asked people subjectively how much effort does it take um, to understand this demonstration, people uh, get, told us that subjectively, and also objectively in terms of response time, um, it was harder to understand the demonstrations that were actually leading to better performance. Maybe this is a good thing, actually. You don't always want to make learning easy. Um, learning should be in that kind of zone of proximal development where you're, you're pushing people's knowledge. Um, but it was an interesting, surprising finding. So in general, um, this is a method for trying to flip the script and have robots teach humans what the robot agents know, what their policy is, by giving humans demonstrations. So in the talk, I'll just summarize what we discussed today. Um, we talked about this pipeline for learning from people. And we talked about how People give us different kinds of feedback, not just demonstrations, um, and how those feedback types are different, both in terms of the information that they provide to the agent and the amount of effort they take for people to communicate them. Um, then we also looked at a method for actively selecting for feedback types that considers those two different opposing elements, the uh, information to the robot and the uh, effort for the user. Um, and finally, we discussed a method for trying to close the loop by giving the human teacher a better understanding of the robot's knowledge by having the robot itself give demonstrations back to the human user. OK, none of this happens, obviously, without the incredible graduate students and undergrads um, and collaborators that I work with. Um, and I have all the best ones, so I'm sure you guys are pretty great, but mine are the best. Uh, so thank you to those people. Um, and I'll just end with this slide that kind of summarizes the findings that if we want robots to be collaborative, we need to have them adapt and learn in the ways that make sense for people. Thank you. I'll take questions. Uh -huh. I work in aerospace. I just I wouldn't be <laughs> So I wonder if you, if you saw any significant variation or if you showed demonstrations to the users for what they expect as good or bad before they took the years. Or was that like truly insignificant? Um, so this was about confidence. Uh, I, I, have, I have the text of the paper here, so I can give you the right answer. Um, so in the Lunar Lander case, people were significantly more confident oh, using showing and characterizing. So it, they did feel more confident in teaching the robot, giving it a direct demonstration, than they did in trying to um, either tell the robot what part of the demonstration was wrong or uh, give two examples. So it might be less about the fact that they, it's hard to do that. Um, 
people really liked showing, I think in part in this domain because it kind of felt like a video game. Um, pretty low stakes compared to Arrow, <laughs> um, Arrow Astro, but uh, they felt like it was conveying more information. So they were more confident that they were gonna like teach the robot what it needed to know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Cindy, for the great talk. Um, so in the very last part that you were talking about, I was actually getting really excited. I thought you maybe were gonna do that, but it didn't seem like so far you've done it, so I wanted to ask you if you thought about it. It looks like there's this there's this cool idea of, well, here's what you might think might be the right way to mm -hmm. go about things, but actually here's sort of a, another demo that we think might shift your belief in that way. Have you thought about actually offering sort of two demos and ah. saying, by the way, this thing, which you might think is the right thing to do, is not as good at doing this other thing. So, so I'm actively telling the human That's interesting. Not this thing, yeah, thing. yeah, um, I love that. We have not. I would say, off the cuff, that seems like another type of feedback, because it's not a demonstration alone. It's like a demonstration of a preference. Right, um, like a combination of this mm -hmm, like a like a contrast, which is really interesting, and um, we should talk more about that. Uh, what we are doing, though, so we're not doing that, but what we are doing right now is um, uh, having the system check, test people for their knowledge intermittently during the learning task. So everything I talked about here, the agent demonstrates, and then we test the human. Um, but we added a, a more closed loop method where the agent demonstrates one concept, tests the human on that concept. And if we find that the people are not understanding that concept, we do a remedial demonstration um, to try to get their knowledge back up, and then we move on to the next concept. Um, so we are doing, and, and that because we're modeling people's knowledge, we're able to kind of adapt to what they know, and then you know, when we get evidence that they know something that's different than what we hypothesize, we reset the particle filter. So we are doing that. Um, but uh, I love that additional kind of feedback. I think it would be super interesting to try. So the, um, the question is, uh, when a human is providing a demonstration like with a robot arm, which is also a trajectory, how hard is it for people to account for the feasibility of different actions? Um, that's a great question. So I haven't tested it empirically, um, although I think it would be very interesting to test empirically along a bunch of different dimensions. But anecdotally, people are very bad at understanding the affordances of a robot, um, joint limits and, uh, and things like that. Even in the lunar lander case, um, I, I find it quite hard still to do lunar lander. Um, people are not very good at predicting how um, activating thrust in a certain direction is going to cause the dynamics of the system to change. Um, and so I think what has the, the nice thing about people giving demonstrations in robot action space is that they can't do something, they can't give a demonstration that the robot is not capable of. Um, what that means, though, is that sometimes they give us suboptimal demonstrations. And so then we have to account for that. And that's kind of where the other feedback types can play a role as well. If we think that demonstrations are becoming less uh, informative because they are more suboptimal, um, we can look to other feedback types to mitigate that. Yeah, great question. Spoken like somebody who's tried to teach a robot to do something through telehealth. <laughs> Ah, okay, so when they're learning the policy, is there, do they sort of like uh, re reduce to some sort of like state, like Maybe find some minimum? Small, for yeah. Um, that is possible, yeah. So when you think about it in terms of BEC area, um, yeah, there are definitely points where, well, there's definitely points where different weights are functionally equivalent 
in an environment, they're not going to generate different kinds of trajectories. <laughs> but the question, I guess, is whether um, people might have uh, a bigger BEC area than that, where two trajectories to them seem essentially equivalent, but in reality, they're not. Um, I would say that's likely. Um, and I think it depends on the domain and the complexity and things like that, and like how similar the weights are to each other. Um, I would say it's likely, and I would also say that uh, given what I know about human psychology, people would probably have very strong reasons for why they thought um, these two trajectories are the same or different that may or may not actually adhere to reality. Um, and so working with what people actually perceive of the demonstration rather than the actual value of the reward function is important, which is sort of what underscores your point, I think. Yeah. Like if, if the robot has many options to choose from and it's only choosing the same thing every time, what is the human like overfit then maybe assign some like false causality? Yeah. Yeah. So we were not choosing the same thing every time. We were sampling. I cannot remember what sampling method we used. Um, I will say for for the early work, for the particle filter work here, um, every time we go through this, we reweight the particles and we can add noise that will change. The, um, the particles weight, so not everything will be selected at the same time. Also here, actually, more relevantly, I think, um, I didn't mention the red crosses that are on this image. So actually, instead of sampling a particular particle, what we were doing was clustering and then um, hypothesizing the, um, the, uh, the reward weights that were in the center of that cluster. So we were sort of averaging a, like a range of different particle weights, and I think that helped mitigate some of this issue of one particle being just a little bit higher than all the other ones and being asked over and over. Yeah. Thanks very much.